actually, we have an amazing guest uh, on the show. We've got Brett Larson here from eVisit, who's leading up the company. And eVisit is a telemedicine patient um, engagement platform for small and medium um, businesses in the healthcare area, primarily healthcare practices. Um, Brett is leading up the company over there, so I'm very glad to have them on the show. Welcome to Pathum Presents, Brett. Thanks, Lucas. Very good. So tell us about eVisit. What is it all about in your own words? Yeah, so uh, actually, so eVisit, we're, we're a virtual care platform developed for enterprise health systems. So we don't serve the smaller side of the market as much as we serve large enterprise health systems. Mm -hmm. uh, the platform's designed to mimic the experience that a patient has in office. Um, it, the reality is most patients will never know they're using eVisit software. They'll think it's the hospital software. We custom brand it for, uh, you know, the banner healths and the advents and the ascensions of the world um, so that they can use their own providers to, uh, to help their own patients. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So uh, maybe for everybody who's listening in to get a good understanding of the company, um, maybe I have a couple of quick questions for you about the company so they can, you know, grab, grab their mind around your company. So um, maybe tell us an interesting thing about the company. You know, how many clients do you have? How many visitors on the page? You know, maybe prices that you've won. What's something remarkable? Yeah, so uh, we founded eVisit in uh, November of 2014 is when we left all of our, all of us left our full-time jobs to go to go quick and fast on uh, building building eVisit. We have uh, we, we we serve uh, the category leaders in healthcare around the U.S. Um, so the largest health systems and healthcare provider networks in the country. Uh, we have a little over 140 customers uh, all across all across the U.S. Very good. Uh, good. Yeah. And when you're mentioning the, the customers, I was just about to ask, who, who are they? You alluded a little bit to it already. Like, how would you describe the customers? Yeah, we, so we serve organizations like Banner Health, um, uh, Ascension, which is the largest health system in the, in the U.S., uh, Advent, which is the second largest health system. We have customers like Envision Health, mm -hmm. um, which is the largest uh, hospital-based physician group in the country. Uh, so it, they are their larger enterprise groups that are looking to uh, maintain and enhance the relationship they have with their own patients uh, when they can't be physically together. Interesting. And, and for this type of large clients, like what would you say has been sort of, you know, emerging as the top channel or top acquisition channel to win those, those big ships? That's, that's an interesting question. I, I think with any growth experience, you, you know, it's, it's not, it's never just one thing, you know, as you look at, the amount of interactions that have to happen between a brand and and their consumer, it, you know, it's about twelve to eighteen touch, touches that it takes before the consumer actually trusts the brand well enough to to engage. Uh, and so for us, it's it's we try to we try to initiate as many of those touch points in a way that adds value as possible over the course of our interactions. Uh, so we're leveraging channels like search engine optimization, search engine marketing. Um, a, a huge, huge part of our strategy is around content. Mm -hmm. So how do we how do we provide value to our customers through you know through the content that we're developing? Um, you know, our we, we we drive all of that drives around an account based marketing strategy. So our focus is on the top, you know, five thousand health hospitals and health systems in the country, um, which is a pretty specific narrow market. And so our you know it's really about how do we gain awareness. Um, and provide value in that process so that when they start evaluating their options uh, for their virtual care strategy, they come to e-visit. You mentioned that SEO and content plays basically a major role. Um, what, what role does the website then play for the client acquisition experience? It's, it, it's the core central purpose, right? Like when, when, we're, when we're driving engagement interaction, the call to action is always to come visit us at the website to learn more about the product, learn more about the problems that we solve, learn more about the customers who we've helped to solve those problems. Um, and so it really, it's, it's the own space that we use to really evangelize our, our perspective on how virtual care should be done, which is by local healthcare infrastructure, right? It's not by national provider networks. It's by the hospital system that you would walk into as a patient, you know, in your backyard. 
Very interesting. Um, speaking about the website there, and then I would have a small follow-up on this one because right now I would be very curious what you would think is the sort of the major strength of the website, right? Let's say maybe, is it the ability to convert the visitors? Is it the quality of the leads that you're getting through? Is it the user experience? Where do you see sort of the strength of the website? Yeah, again, I think I, uh, of our website or of websites in general? Of yours, evisit.com. Uh, I, th I think um, at evisit, we've, we've worked very hard to deliberately build um, content on the website that helps guide the user to get value. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, the whole goal is that they do convert, that they request more information, that they engage with our sales team, that they get into the funnel and we start, we start to build a relationship. Um, but it, but it really is, it's designed to speak to the user's problems. And so I would say, you know, out of those options you gave, I would probably say it's user experience. Mm -hmm. Um, they come to the website and they get value and leave without taking action. We've still accomplished our goal at some level, which is, which is to build trust and to, and to transfer value so that they can, you know, our vision at eVisit is to simplify healthcare delivery to everyone everywhere. Mm -hmm. And whether that's, you know, for us, it's very important that we have strong alignment with customers. And so if we're not the right tool for them to do that, you know, our philosophy is that we'll help you, we'll recommend the right tool for you based on what we've learned from you. Um, and so it, it, the website is designed to help guide them toward that path of, you know, what is the right tool? Is it something as robust as eVisit or is it, is it something that's still a great product, but more simple like Doxy, you know, which is more, which is more targeted towards a small practice, you know, you know, single physicians, but, you know, if that's what's more appropriate, um, that's, that's where you should be. Makes sense. So you're mentioning really the user experience there being sort of a strength. I have to ask now, obviously, on the other hand, like, what do you think is, you know, an area where the website has room for improvement, right? Is it then sort of the ability to convert the visitors? Is it, you know, the quality of the leads that are coming through? Where would you see is the room for improvement? You know, I, I think for me, it's always about visibility, you know, is, is how, how uh, prevalent, like when, you know, we worked hard, from our content side of, of getting good placement in search and um, you know, but the markets become much more competitive over the last three years mm -hmm. uh, you know, and Google's algorithms have evolved. And so it's, it's an ever ongoing battle to make sure that you're maintaining those placements that the, that the content's being refreshed and continues to be valuable and is current. Um, you know, and that's, that's when you're a scaling organization um, with, you know, in those early bootstrap days uh, it's sometimes, you know, we're past that now, but, it's sometimes difficult to uh, to find all the time and resources needed to actually to actually build that consistently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, I want to come back to your product, right? We've been speaking about the website a bit. Um, so for everybody who's listening in, what would you say is sort of is the main competitive advantage of the product? Yeah, so I, I think there's really three, um, and and it's more about the company. Uh, one of the first is about the company. The rest is about the product. The first one is even as its business model at its core is non-competitive. I mean, we, we don't employ a physician network. So our customers um, use our platform with their own doctors, right? They put their own physicians on the platform who then treat their own patients. Um, whereas like an American Well or a Teladoc or an MD Live, while great organizations, um, if you as a hospital go buy their product, you're basically funneling dollars into their patient acquisition strategy um, you know, through the health plan solutions that they offer. So the first is we're, we're, we'll never compete with hospitals. We're a partner. Um, the second is, uh, is the configurability of the product. So when, when you walk into a large health system, um, they are, they are, they're just, it's, it's a large organization. And just like any other large organization, the processes that, that run the operations of that organization are complex. You know, if you're walking in for a primary care visit, as a patient, you have ex one experience, but if you're going in for an orthopedic um, you know, surgery, you have an entirely different experience. And so for hospitals to accommodate all those workflows, it's not a one size fits all process. And so one of the big differentiators in the product is that, it, that even as its product is highly configurable, we have modules that can be pushed or pulled into the experience of the patient pathway and the provider experience such that we can, we can create um, you know, we can mirror the experience and the technology that, that they have in the office. It's just a lot more pleasant. And then the third uh, difference here in the product is really the, uh, the user experience, user interface. You know, so the mandate that we give our product and engineering teams 
is that is that it needs to feel at home on an iPhone between Facebook and Fortnite. You know, it needs to be just as usable by my by my seventy year old mother as it is my seven year old son. It needs to be you know as consumers we have choice. If we don't like Facebook, we'll use Instagram. Um, you know because of its simplicity or how easy it is to post a picture. You know and so as we look at Eva, it it really is about how do we make how do we how do we try to get as much of the information needed to for so that hospitals can provide appropriate care while requesting as little as possible from the patient. And so, you know, our intake process takes usually about 90 seconds. Uh, we're fully integrated with the electronic health record. Like all those little things that, that, that take clicks away from the experience are super important. You know, I, I strongly believe that the future of software will be a peripheral experience, meaning I walk in and software responds because I'm there versus me having to pull out my iPhone and tell the software what to do. And so if you look at Eve's roadmap, it's really shifting towards a, how do we, how do we move into more of a proactive care experience where we're reaching out to a patient and saying, Hey, we noticed that you aren't, you know, that you've stopped running as much and your caloric intake has increased and you're, you, you weigh more, you know, you're at high risk for hypertension and diabetes. Let's get you in now to make sure that doesn't become a more serious issue later. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it really, I think, it really comes down to the experience that we provide and how simple it is to navigate as a patient and, and a provider. So very, very rounded up collection there of, of benefits. Very good. Um, looking at the team or the structure of eVisit a little bit, like how would you say are the sales and the marketing team structured at the moment? You know, we're, we're, we're building a structure around, around a few areas. One is demand generation. So, so what is, what does it look like at the top of the funnel and how are those leads attracted um, the second is is around um, the li- the customer lifecycle nurture. So from awareness to um, renewal, what what do the interactions look like? How does how does the brand interact? How do individuals interact from the brand? What does that represent? Uh, what what's the messaging? And then the third is really thought leadership, or again the content. And I, those are in no particular order, mm-hmm. but they all work interchangeably, right? One doesn't work well without the other. But we've really we're really focused on how do we organize it around those three components and what do the teams look like underneath those? Mm-hmm. Um, what do the metrics look like to to measure those and and how are we A B testing each of the initiatives there to get the right attention from our customers and to provide the right value once we have their attention. Very interesting. And um, maybe as a as a last follow up question to this uh, on that topic, um, a lead right that will be coming through through the website. Can you maybe tell us how it would be handled between sort of marketing and sales? Because that has been a very um, a constant conversation actually on the podcast. Maybe you can walk us through the process, like how a lead is handled from you know the website sign up forward. Yeah, I mean, over the last six years, we, again, we've narrowed our target market down to a pretty well-defined group of organizations, um, and so there's you know our our uh, CRM. We've done a lot of work to to architect lead scoring. Uh, mechanisms to understand, you know, how active and engaged has this lead been? Mm-hmm. What stage of the buying cycle are they in based on what content they've interacted with? If, they, if they've gone and downloaded, you know, the definitive guide to purchasing a virtual care platform and their title is, you know, VP of virtual care, it's a highly relevant lead who's probably late in the buying process or, or, or has made a decision to buy and starting to dive in to understand what criteria they should be looking at. Mm-hmm. That's a very, so they may not have requested a demo or, or to have a further sales conversation as part of that, but it's, it's indicative to us on the marketing side that, hey, sales, take a look at this lead. You should follow up and ask them if they got what they were looking for and see what other value you might be able to provide. And so depending on the interactions that a, um, that a customer or a potential customer has with our organization and, and how uh, they've identified themselves, um, we've built interactive campaigns that will respond differently to that and, um, and, and uh, call attention that they are urgent, uh, a more urgent or more, more prepared prospect or, or less so. And then there's always the audit, the audit on our end that goes, that goes into it on the back end. like no, no lead scoring mechanism is hundred percent accurate. And so that it's important for us that we have a mechanism to follow up there and, and, you know, audit those and make sure that, you know, warm interested opportunities aren't slipping through the cracks and that we're, we're placing the right um, attention we need to on those. 
Very good. Let's switch gears a little bit and learn about you personally as a leader uh, in, in the company. Uh, that's very interesting always. So maybe tell me what type of content do you consume? Like how do you educate yourself to, you know, be able to, to guide and lead the team? Yeah, you know, I think um, I, uh, I read a lot. Uh, typically it's, it's um, you know, I have a, a bookshelf full of things that, that uh, are on my list of things to read, but it's, it's you know, I, I think it's really important as, as, as you're evolving, you know, every, it, it's interesting as you grow as an organization, you know, zero to 1 million, you're dealing with a different set of operational opportunities and challenges than you are from one to 10. And one to 10 is different than, you know, 10 to 25 and 25 to 100 is a whole different ball game. You can usually track the challenges, at least in my experience, you can track the challenges that, that you, uh, that you're going to experience almost, um, there's almost a direct correlation to the number of people in the organization because what's required to run an organization of call it seven to 12 individuals, uh, team members is different than what's required to lead an organization of 60, which is different than, than what's required to lead an organization of a thousand. And so, um, you know, in the early days, uh, it was about, you know, how to drive efficiency and figure out you know, content around, you know, um, developing culture and laying the foundation for, for, uh, building that organization. You know, today it's it's really focused more on, um, you know, how to how to keep pace. You know, I, I, what I found is a lot of a lot of individuals or professionals, they have a place that they enjoy spending time at um, from a growth perspective. Like some of us are really good from zero to one, some of us are really good from one to ten. Others of us love, you know, where things are more established and you come in from fifteen million plus. Um, and so the content that I consume is different based on. Uh, based on where I've been in the growth journey myself. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, and what would be a topic that you most recently really focused on and really did a deep dive? Um, I, I, well, one of the things I'll tell you, one of my favorite books uh, is The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's not because um, I actually don't know. Well, maybe for some people, four hours a week is, is possible, but for me, it's the book isn't actually about working four hours a week. It's about uh, identifying where uh, where your time should be spent. You know, it's about building processes and systems around low value activities uh, for your role, um, and so that you can spend more time on high value activities. You know, and and it's about pro uh, building those processes around those low value activities, so you know they happen, uh, how they need to happen, and when they need to happen so that you can focus your time on the high value activities. Um, so that's, that's actually a book I read usually about once a year just to remind myself and, and do a personal inventory on, on like, okay, well, what actions do I, what, what are the things I'm doing every day that, um, that if I spent that time, you know, working on a big customer or a big partnership or, you know, raising capital that might be able to get the business further along. Um, and so the, 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 that's the, the, one of the things I go back to, uh, you know, every, every year. I think more recently, uh, my time has been spent a lot more on culture. Um, we started the year with about 27 team members today. We're at 60 by the end of the year, we'll be closer to a hundred, right? That's, that's, um, it's very, very difficult to manage culture at that, at that rapid of scale, because every team member you add either, uh, adds to, or takes away from the culture. There's never any, like, and frankly, I don't think you want to bring on team members. And my, and at Eve is, I don't really want team members who are neutral. Okay. You know, like hopefully they're all additive, but sometimes you make mistakes. And it's not that they're bad team members; it's just that they're it's not the right fit from a culture perspective. And so, um, I've been spending a lot of my time just on, on you know, how do we be more deliberate about culture? How do we how do we make decisions and not wait for things to happen? Uh, what expectations do we set for team members, and what expectations do we have? of them and of ourselves and how we show up and how we interact and how we get work done. And there's been a lot of time there in the last probably six months or so. Since we're slowly coming to an end of the interview, um, I would have a, you know, a set of rapid fire questions. Usually, you know, it's one sentence questions, one word, one sentence answers. Are you ready for those? Hit me. Very good. Actually, the first one you already kind of touched upon, but you know, what's the last book that you read? Maybe not the one that you read regularly, but the last one that you read. Um, the hard thing about hard things. Yeah. What's the one single thing that your company is focused on the most at the moment? Uh, growth. Mm -hmm. 
if there would be no boundaries in technology, what would be one thing that you would want to have fixed for your company today? Uh, data, you know, how, how, how data is aggregated and defined and translated. Mm -hmm. Is that sort of just curious on the product side, on, on the sort of on the acquisition side, where were you thinking about that? Well, so all, all of the above. I mean, if, if you look at, you know, um, at Eva's anyway, all of our data is interconnected. You know, the, the, the way that a customer buys uh, has a lot of impact on the way they use the product. It has a lot of impact on the, on what renewal looks like um, the way they, the way, the way you use the product, like it, it, every single piece of data we collect sends around the customer. Um, and it's so the data more specifically around the operations, the organization and how that impacts our customers and the experience that they have. Very good. Two more to go. What's the last thing that kept you awake at night about your company? Uh, the team in a good way, you know, like as, as quickly as we're scaling, uh, the team, you know, there's, uh, the COVID has had a, a, a big impact on our business in a good way. Um, but it's also required a lot of time and energy and, um, work-life balance is important. I, you know, I, I've come to learn that work-life balance is different for everyone, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, what works for me may not work for my CFO or my marketing manager or, you know, one of our interns and, um, and the work-life balance that we maintain, like we still have an obligation to come in and do the work that we've been asked to do and that we're responsible for. But, you know, I'm a strong believer that you uh, happy people um, make happy team members, make successful organizations and make that, that can have an impact that they're intended to have the organization in the market. And so, you know, I think a lot of what I spent my time on is how do we make EVIS a place where people can have that work-life balance, but also have the tools that they need uh, to enjoy the work they do and accomplish that work effectively. Mm -hmm. okay. Very last question. If today uh, would be the first day you starting to work on e-visit, what would be one advice that you would give yourself? That's a great question. Um, That's a really good question. Hopefully you're editing this because I'm not sure. I might need some time to think about it. <laughs> there are so many, there, there are so many pieces of advice. It's hard to choose just one. I think one of the biggest ones would just be um, slow down. You know, I, I, there's, there's, uh, and I mean that, that there's always pressure on growth. Mm -hmm. um, but I think uh, being deliberate about how you grow and where you grow um, is very important. And growth for growth's sake, uh, in my mind, isn't there's there's no value there. Like, what what is the purpose behind the growth? For us at Eve, is it, it's it's very mission driven. Um, we uh, we're focused on simplifying healthcare delivery to everyone everywhere. Like, it is we have a very strong social mission. That's uh, and, it, and it's great. It's supported by a very strong financial mission, mm -hmm. and it's nice when those two things can align. Very nice answer. So thanks a lot for being on the show, Brad, with us today. Um, I want to give you the last word, right? Um, if somebody forgets everything that we talked about today in the interview, what would be the one thing that they should remember about eVisit? Uh, that, that, we're, that we're changing the world. Uh, that sounds super cliche, but um, with that vision or mission to simplify healthcare delivery to everyone everywhere, you know, we're strong believers that one of the two biggest problems in the world is the availability and access to qualified healthcare. Like we're we believe that's a that's a human right, regardless of where you live or what you believe or how how you get to school every day or work every day, um, and and so we're we're pushing hard to make that available to everyone everywhere. Very good. Thanks for being part of Python Presents today. Awesome. Thanks, Lucas. <laughs>